it for you. Hello and welcome to the video. Within this video guide I'm going to take you through the process of brewing this recipe and its methods that work especially well in combination to produce a surprisingly good low alcohol IPA that is thirst quenching and pleasingly hoppy. As per usual I'm going to explain everything so that you can develop a good understanding of how and why this all works. So let's get started. Ahead of this brew I strongly suggest that you prepare the recipe so that it best emulates mine before you order in your ingredients. In terms of grain you are going to need to find the closest types available with your chosen homebrew store to match the final colour as well as the predicted gravity. This may mean that your grain bill will look a little bit different to mine but as long as you are close in gravity then this is the main concern. The secret to beer is balance and alcohol is the first part of this equation. The second part of this equation is bitterness which is adjusted by hops. You should look at my hop schedule and take note of my alpha acid percentage compared to your own. It is highly likely that mine will be different to yours so the weights of each addition that I use will need to be different to yours. I suggest following the IBU levels that can be found on Brewfather and the written copy of the recipe in this video's description. This is especially fast and easy to do by simply entering in your own hops alpha acid percentage and then matching each hop addition to my recipe's individual IBU levels. If you do not follow these steps for this recipe then it will not be the recipe as intended. Naturally these points are the same for any recipe you may find be it in a book or online. And lastly your final preparation is in respect of your water profile. Personally I recommend that you use the hoppy profile indicated on screen which is found in Brewfather. If you are new to homebrewing then you will be forgiven for skipping this part though, but keep it in mind for the future as water profiling to style can offer your end results a very satisfying boost. Let's now move on to the brew. As you may have already noticed there is not much grain involved in this recipe compared to a regular one. Your recipe calculator is going to advise on a very small amount of mash water volume for this, simply because of how they work. I would strongly suggest that you add in some of the sponge water to make this more realistic for mashing. I personally added 2 litres of extra water. I appreciate that most people would probably not want a full batch of this, so I have put together this video on how you would manage a small batch size, along with what to watch out for if you go this smaller batch route. My recipe shared is just 10 litres or 2.64 US liquid gallons. If a different volume suits you then this is easily scaled in Brewfather and as per usual I am sharing a link to the recipe in this video's description. This recipe was co-written by myself and the awesome Andrew Patterson of Lollamond who is an ex-commercial brewer too. Andrew has completed some very interesting work with low ABV beers and has written some great documentation on the topic for Lollamond. I am sharing a link to this information in this video's description and these methods are also being used here of course which I will explain and demonstrate. So here is the mash. You will notice that despite using a grain father here I am not using the top mash plate. This is because using this very small amount of grain the mash plate is really not going to work properly. So there is really no point having it on and after brewing this recipe various times now this has no consequence so do not be concerned. With this recipe there is also really no need to mash this for longer than 40 minutes in total with no mash out step needed either. Another key difference is that this recipe calls for low wart fermentability which in Andrew's published Lollamon article is created by mashing at high temperatures which are recommended at between 78 to 82 degrees Celsius or approximately 172 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Personally I found very good results at 79 degrees Celsius which is the equivalent of 174 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is the temperature recommended for this recipe. Let's now look at this recipe's vital statistics and grain bill. At less than 1% alcohol it should be of no surprise that there is a low overall IBU score here too. The combination of these two gives a BUGU ratio of 0.52 but with this recipe and methods used this is not the final story as we have further additions coming later on that will change this further. This is not translated into the numbers shown here but it will change the perception. More on this later as we come to it. In terms of our grain bill this is pretty simple. At 85% we have parallel malt which is going to give this recipe its main source of fermentables and is as such our canvas for flavour. At 5% we have acid malt which is simply used as a convenient way to drop pH. If you do not wish to use this malt then you can replace this with parallel malt. 
The carapil shown here is a dextrin style maul that is primarily used here to increase mouthfeel, but it will also improve head retention as a nice bonus. Dextrin malts contain long chain sugars that are unfermentable, hence the effect. Do be aware that some homebrew stores will substitute this with a low EBC crystal malt, so be sure to express your interest in a dextrin version as this is important to this recipe. The Munich malt shown here at 5% will add in a little bit of colour, but its main role is to add in some malt flavour backing, but certainly not much, because with this recipe we want the hops to have the main voice. It was then time for a quick sparge with the top mashing plate added for even distribution. Moving on to the boil now, and my first step is always to clear the protein from the top first, as shown. Not only does this avoid a boil over, but it also allows the protein to drop down where we actually want it. Let us now look at this phase of the brew with details now on the right hand side of the screen. You will note that this recipe has a 30 minute boil. This is simply because I really do not want to boil off any more flavour than necessary, particularly with a brew of this type. The first hop addition is at 15 minutes with this in mind, and this is also used in a similar way to the New England style of IPA. This recipe uses the forever popular combination of Centennial and Mosaic. This combination brings high levels of citrus along with mango and pine that is backed with tropical and floral elements. The bitterness has a level of depth and the aroma is very forward, which is taken even further by the dry hops that come later on in this recipe. Because we only have a small amount of alcohol to play with in such a recipe, even small levels of hops and the bitterness that comes along with them can tip the balance into making this one taste more bitter than is actually desirable, which will certainly be counterproductive in terms of drinkability. It is of course important with such a style as this that good levels of hop flavour aroma are actually present though. Lactose is added during the boil which will further mouthful in tandem with our grain bill but it will also smooth out the overall perception of bitterness which is important in this recipe for taste balance aiding in drinkability. This addition can be added at any time of the actual boil though a later addition time is a bit more desirable as lactose can make minor changes to hop utilisation though with a brew such as this you probably would not notice it. Moving on now to the hop stand. This is performed at 80 degrees Celsius or 176 degrees Fahrenheit to preserve hop utilisation which drops off at lower temperatures. Be sure to add your immersion chiller before you have finished your boil to keep everything nice and sanitary. Five minutes before the end of the boil is ideal. I am using the Jaded Brewing Scylla Immersion Chiller for this due to its crazy speed. I am using one of the various techniques here to improve cooling speed even further, which is where you stir the water around the chiller. I put lots of Immersion Chiller advice in my look at the Jaded Brewing Scylla Chiller video, which was released earlier this year, so check that out for more information if needed. The method shown here allowed me to chill from boiling point to 80 degrees Celsius in less than one minute. Moving on now to the cooling and transfer phase where I am adding and rehydrating my yeast with cold wort. I am using Lullamans Windsor yeast for this brew but there are actually two other types of yeast that I know of that will also work which are now shown on the right hand side of the screen. The vital aspect for this recipe that these three different types of yeast have in common is that they will all not ferment one particular type of sugar found in wort known as maltotriose. At the very least they will leave most of it behind. This leads to them being known as what is known as maltotriose negative. The use of such yeast is another fantastic aspect of this complete method that really works very well in producing low ABV beers that are full of flavour. There are further details about this aspect of the method that can be found in the best practices for a low alcohol beer PDF linked in this video's description. If this is your first time using Windsor then you will quickly find out that this yeast is one hungry beast of a yeast. It is well known for eating through regular warts in three days, and it can certainly handle this one in less than this time, perhaps a day if you have created the perfect environment for it. Shown on screen now in blue is the starting temperature for this yeast as well as the finishing temperatures that I recommend. The difference between the top temperature in blue and the bottom temperature in red should be built up over three days to protect against DMS and also to ensure full attenuation. During fermentation this brew has a dry hop. Personally I favour these large stainless steel tea strainers due to their weight and how easy they are to clean and sanitise before use. Other tea strainers may be used of course, just ensure to fill them no more than 50% to allow for hop expansion. Before adding this to your fermenter use hand sanitizer before touching and then adding the actual container. 
Be sure to add it and allow it to drop. We do not want this sitting at the top because the oil of the hop is our only real interest and oil will simply sit at the top of liquid if allowed to do so. By allowing the hops to drop quickly we resolve this issue. I always suggest dry hopping before you reach final gravity with your yeast, usually when 5 to 10 gravity points away, but with this recipe dry hopping soon after fermentation starts is a very viable option. Another addition for this brew that you may wish to consider is using aromazyme. This is a blend of enzymes that as you can see increase hop flavour and aroma. I have to say that I have only used this just once and this was within this actual brew. So really at this point I cannot realistically give it my full thumbs up due to having just one test case. But I did notice an increase in hop flavour and aroma as expected as well as a further smoothing out of the bitterness in the beer compared to previous batches. So so far so good. I have not included aromazine in the final recipe as all testing was performed without it leading up to this film brew, but my tasting notes which are coming next are given with its presence. So here is how the end result looks as it is being poured into a glass. At the point of filming this has been in a keg for just one week and this is a great time to start drinking this according to my taste buds like many other IPA styles. However you will notice it becomes a little cleaner tasting given an extra week or two. Here is the same pour from a different angle with the glass a little bit closer. I have not cold crashed this beer or used anything to give it clarity, but you certainly could if you are looking for a clear looking result. The lactose used here will not get in the way of this and does not make beer cloudy. I rather like this natural look. Let me know in the comments section what you think. Let's now move on to the tasting notes. Let's start with aroma. Due to the use of Centennial this has a very forward aroma that is both citrus and floral. The mosaic is also there in the middle background with its tropical berry and mango mix. This certainly makes for an inviting combination. Flavour. The flavour here is very classic IPA. On entry you will note a citrus flavour that is followed by tropical fruit and pine. The finish is smooth and clean, not unlike a New England IPA, and this also has a similar level of body too. If you are looking for more body then you can push this up to 2.7 CO2 volumes, though I personally prefer it at 2.4. This is a good area to experiment with for sure. Here are some notes. This beer is ideal as a summer daytime barbecue beer for those that still want to be fresh for the evening, as one example. Beers like this are also perfect for those very hot days as due to the lack of alcohol you will find that you will not dehydrate as quickly as if you would with a stronger beer. When I first started this project I had in the back of my mind that this may never taste good enough for me to share on my channel. However I have been pleasantly surprised just how good this combination of techniques and this final recipe have worked. This is a kind of hybrid IPA beer that I have served various people now without announcing at first its alcohol level. Predictions from tasters so far have been in the region of between 4-5% to ABV, which was certainly higher than I expected, but this is certainly very pleasing. Once the alcohol level has been revealed people have been quite shocked as they associate low alcohol with low body and flavour, which is certainly not the case here, especially when drunk fresh. Due to the high citrus element and tropical fruit this proves to be a very refreshing and easy drinking beer. I do hope that you found this video useful, informative and interesting. If so, why not consider liking and subscribing? For further support you can join the channel's Facebook group and if you would like to support the channel then check out the channel's merchandise store as all profits go back into the channel. Until next time, happy brewing!